The first question. The question that must never be answered. And what's your first name? Basil. Zygons, humans, and I'm not sure which is which. This is the 131st episode of Unearthly Podcast, streaming live on the 11th of November, 2015, and featuring the Zygon Inversion, written by Peter Harness. I am Bill Sylvia, the Man in Black, and with me are Mad Matt Winchell. I'm not dead yet. Randy Ronson McCulloch. I have strapped my smartphone to my arm to turn it into a pip boy. And Tim the Enchanter Sheridan. Oh, faith in Begora. <laughs> Aaron Romeo Moon Burke will not be with us tonight because she is not feeling under the weather at the moment. So, mm. wish her a speedy better, recovery. I've never understood that expression because generally the weather does start above our head and we are generally <laughs> under it. You're also the kind of person to wonder why no one's ever whelmed, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're either overwhelmed or underwhelmed, but you're never whelmed. Well, we just don't say it when we're whelmed. Don't know what to say, the monkeys won't do. Well, don't know what to is say, the natural monkeys won't do. do. <laughs> and we are off to a lovely start, like we always are. <laughs> Four idiots on a podcast. That really should be the name here. <laughs> All right. So, that, so um, we will have to wait till next week to get Aaron's opinions on... Uh, the episode as she uh, has retired to bed before giving us uh, what her opinions were, unless she sent them to you, Bill. She did not. Okay, so we'll wait till next week. All right, so we'll uh, start with the news, and we have some birthdays. Actually, we had a lot of birthdays. I had to Yay. pare them down from about 50 Good to... Grief. Uh, well, a lot of them were people who had only appeared in, like, one episode in the classic era. So I, appear, I paired them down to people that were turning big numbers or big names. So uh, first of all is a happy birthday to June Whitfield, who played Minnie Hooper in uh, The End of Time, Part 1 and 2. Uh, she turned 90 today. Oh, she's just trucking right along. Oh yeah. Do you, do you happen to know who that character is within the story? Because I'm yeah, she's I recognize one, the name, but uh, Minnie. She's one of Wilf's friends, the one that keeps hitting on everybody. Oh, from uh, from when Wilf organized the bus group to find the doctor. Yes, the Silver Cloak, I believe it was called. Gotcha. I, I knew I recognized the name, but I couldn't. She she it. she's the one that groped David Tennant in the in the, in the buttocks. <laughs> I, I wondered if that was scripted or not. I don't know. It depends on how she is as a person. Also, uh, happy birthday to Claire Higgins, who played uh, Ohilia in uh, Night of the Doctor and the Magician's Apprentice. That is the uh, member of the Sisterhood of Karn. She turned 60 yesterday. Oh. So that means she can play that role for another 20 years, hopefully. At least. And then finally, a happy birthday to Neil Gaiman the writer of The Doctor's Wife, Nightmare and Silver, amongst many, many other things, who uh, turned 55 yesterday. Neil Gaiman was recently confirmed as getting his own TV series next year. Nice. So he's I, not going to be the Doctor Who showrunner. I actually, actually, I had to respond to the Facebook post revealing that to me, saying I'm actually slightly disappointed in this. I was hoping he'd become the next showrunner for Doctor what? Who. 
Is it what's the show about? I don't know. I only saw oh. the a uh, bit of the news article. I didn't see the details. Gotcha. You didn't see if it announced a name or anything? No, it's just that they they gave him his own show. Let me see if I can find out real quick. And so I my can first tell guess would be some sort of anthology. Probably it's based off of one of one of the uh, many, many things he's done. Uh, it used to be any of his long... A uh, series adaptation of American Gods. Awesome! Um, I've heard good things about that. Okay, yeah. see, Google, Google and, threw me off because when I Google Neil Gaiman TV show, it said American Gods since 2014. Oh yeah, it does say first episode date. Is it a second adaptation? Now I'm confused because I'm seeing... Parts of it Produ that. Production might have started in 2014. It's just taking them a while to get. That's going. possible. No, well, the or pre-production might have started in. Oh, pre-production, yeah. Because it just trying got to get actors. It, it's, it's, it's got green lighted. Now you know who green lights it, Matt. Hmm. Stars. God damn it! <laughs> you know what it was? It was supposed to start in 2014, and then it was canceled. Is what it looks like on Wikipedia, so that's probably where it's saying episode one was in 2014. That was probably the original intended date. That was probably and the intended date, and then Homer was canceled, and then he's found stars who's gone, Hey, you're the guy that does yeah. some of that okay. talking stuff, yeah, right? It was, supposed, it was supposed to be on HBO. Ah. Uh, HBO uh, dropped the ball. Uh, speaking yeah. of TV shows, there is one that I think, uh, it's slightly off topic, so we're going to keep it short, but there's one that I think Matt and I would... Uh, and possibly others would want to re acknowledge. Uh, and that is that uh, Night of the Living Dead director uh, George Romero has, uh, not, is now going to have a television show named uh, Empire of the Dead on, uh, I believe, ABC or AMC, oh. I mean. Mm. Well, AMC, it's basically known for its zombie shows now. Yeah, and appara apparently uh Romero is an outspoken uh, I don't know if opponent is the right word, but he's a very critical of uh, what The Walking Dead has done with the genre. So this is going to be him taking it into his own hands. On or, the same or, or network. Idea of it. Yes. Probably getting no aired <laughs> back to back. <laughs> Probably. Are you right, Romero? Let's find out. So yes. that's, uh, that's what Neil Gaiman's up to. Happy birthday, Neil. Uh, and as for deaths, there are no deaths. Whee! Yay! Everybody lives! Death took a holiday. So or that He's means... visiting the granddaughter. <laughs> well, there are, there's obviously deaths. There's a death, like, you know, once a second in the world, but we'd try not to think about that, because it's rather depressing. <laughs> Thanks for yeah. bringing it there, Randy. But there's no, in, there's no Doctor Who deaths. There's no important deaths, because, yes, every other death in the world is minor. Yada, yada, yes. yada, pretentious bullshit. Um, no, uh, there's been no Doctor Who-related deaths this week that, I can, that I've can that i seen. I looked. Or noticed as of yet. We had two last week, so we, had a, so we filled a quota, so it decided to take a week off. All right. So, we have overnight viewing figures for the Zygon inversion of... 4.13 million viewers watched this episode, according to unofficial overnight viewing figures. It had a 19.9% share of the total TV audience for the day. At the top was the BBC celebrity dance show Strictly Come Dancing, which had 9.17 million, and The X Factor on ITV was second with 6.42 million. Now... That's actually an interesting number. When you compare it with last week's figure, more people were watching with a larger share of the the uh, the TV audience, yet it ranked higher um, last week than it did this week. It was fifth last week, seventh this week. So hmm. with more people, with less people watching last week, it was higher in the rankings. Uh, because the less people were watching TV overall... Apparently. Huh. Was something happening then that... Some big event that kept people out of their homes? I have no clue. I do not live something. in the... I don't think I do they not... have election day in the Britain. Oh, they, they do have election day, but it's not like ours. 
Yeah. It's not anytime soon, as far as I'm aware. Somewhere yeah. within, uh, somewhere yeah. within five years, Hello? the prime minister must run. It must uh, actually, you know, call for an election, and then it must happen within a certain amount of months. Uh, I can barely hear anyone. Can, can you hear me guys... now? That was not intended to be a joke, but I had to say it. Tim. Tim, are we losing Tim? Tim, double check oh. your. Uh, Tim, double check your speakers or something. Because we can hear you fine. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're back. Oh. What the yeah, hell happened? Sorry about that. I don't know. Uh, it was my headphones. Something. Mm -hmm. Something went wonky with your headphones. Sounds like you need one, new ones just like me. Yeah. I do too, actually. But that's a different topic that we should I I, I don't, but I, I was eyeballing Bluetooth headsets just so I wouldn't have to have this long cord. <laughs> Anywho, Anywho article. Article. Next article. Uh, Australian overnight ratings for the Zygon inversion and the final ratings for the woman who lived. The Zygon inversion debuted in Australia, averaging 466,000 viewers in five major capital cities. It was the highest rating Australian broadcasting company drama of the day and the 16th highest rating program of the day overall. These ratings do not include iView regional or time-shifted viewers. Meanwhile, including time-shifted viewers, The Woman Who Lived averaged 647,000 consolidated viewers in the five major capital cities. With 151,000 extra viewers, it was the, lar it was the third highest time-shifted program of the day. The highest time-shifted program had an extra 168,000 viewers and the ninth highest rating program of the day overall. And these ratings do not include iView original viewers. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, what, what does time shifted mean? Uh, I mean, usually when they, uh, usually what will occur is they'll air it on a related channel. Uh, so on a, I think it's usually either an hour or several hours later. And that's, I believe, where we figured out the time shifted came from. I'm, it's like is many that some of my right, Ran? Yeah, it's like many cable networks will air um, a half night of programming and then repeat that half night of programming for the second half in order to get people that live uh, in earlier times or people that come in later. Um, an, an, an example would be when I was a kid, if I missed my uh, 8 a.m. cartoon on Fox 5, I could watch it on Fox 20 at 11. Yeah, oh, but even even with cable networks, it's like Adult Swim will run from eight to like twelve thirty, and then it will show the exact same programming, although not necessarily in the same order from twelve thirty to uh, four in the morning. I get it. Okay, Duke. I think BBC America does that as well. They'll uh, show it at the regular time. They'll show it again, like. Uh, four or five AM, AMC, does, AMC does the same thing where you sh where they'll show like The Walking Dead, uh, Talking Dead, another episode, and then the episode of Walking Dead again. And uh, we have our audience appreciation for the Zygon inversion with a score of eighty four. Yeah, and we just learned that uh, the audience appreciation index is pretty much like your old. Uh, school grading system so an 84 is a b average people hmm. and 82 which is the where the other end of that index has been going is b minus so doctor I, who has mm -hmm. been a b minus to b show for the last two seasons and that uh, that ties this episode along with under the lake and the magician's apprentice as the highest rating episodes of the season according to the audience appreciation index Again, we have no idea who these people are. We were doing some research prior to the podcast and discovered that Day the Doctor, uh, considered to be one of the greatest Doctor Who episodes of all time, only rates an 88 on their index, which is a B+. I'm giving Day the Doctor a B plus is rubbish, which is why I'm starting to question this particular part. And the, the highest that we could find was the, uh, in, in a short period of time anyway, was uh, the Big Bang with an 89. It says uh, doc, the Doctor Who finished as the 47th most watched program of the week. Hmm. 
And uh, mm -hmm. Bill did some research, by the way. The, the AI index uh, goes back as far as the 60s. So they've been using the same system for 50 years now. Yeah, and it's been proven to be flawed many times. But they still use it. Because it can't be bothered so to come up with a better no, one. Britain is no more perfect than the United States, at least when it comes to that. Yep. Uh. Uh, continuing with our ratings, we have our official rating for the Zygon Invasion, uh, which according to BARB, the Broadcasters Audience Research Board, had 5.76 million viewers, making it the 11th most watched program of the day, or sorry, I think of the week, and the third on Saturday. Uh, it was placed uh, at 24th in the chart, so I'm... Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, that country. That sentence contradicts itself. I'm really, no, I'm no less informed than I was before I said it. Okay, <laughs> no, no, that, that, okay, uh, let me, let me ex clear that up. The confusion is because many of these are Not multiple ABC. episodes of the same program. So uh -huh. there's four episodes, uh, at least four episodes of Coronation Street, four episodes of EastEnders, multiple episodes of Emmerdale, The X Factor, etc. So that's why... It's the 24th episode in the chart, the 11th program, because there's so many multiples above it. Top for the week was Strictly Come Dancing with 10.85 million viewers. Followed by a kick to the balls. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's notice, what these people like. That Strictly Come Dancing and The X Factor are the only other ones placing on the top 30 for Saturday. Strictly Come Dancing, we just said, uh, The X Factor had... 7.24 million viewers. <sighs> All right. Uh, continuing our news on uh, other recent Doctor Who episodes, The Magician's Apprentice and The Witch's Familiar scripts are now available online, courtesy of the BBC Writer's Room. Both are written by Stephen Moffat, uh, and this is uh, part of a uh, part of the BBC's project to support and develop writers across the whole of BBC drama. Huh. So I guess this is to encourage people to read the scripts and see I don't how know, they're made. Oh yeah, yeah, maybe just to be familiar with uh, how the episodes are made. Of course, they really didn't have to do that. All they had to do was publish those five scripts that were leaked last year. Yeah. <laughs> just saying. Okay, so we go from past episodes to the future episodes, and we have some production photos for Sleep No More. So you're that saying that we're released. going back to the future. Shut up, Doc Brown. Shut up right now. Money! <laughs> so we have those production photos for uh, Sleep No More. Um, and we have the uh, listing... Um, this terrifying story is assembled from footage discovered in the wreckage of La Verre Space Station. La Verrière Space Station. So, it does look like it's found footage. And the By publicity the image below it does look like, uh, is the Doctor and Clara staring into a camera? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what... Publicity mm. photos are, Bill. People staring off at things off Into screen. Into a film video, or a, a video camera. Not a... Not a oh, a well, yeah. Photography camera. They're, they're not, doing both at the same time. Nothing <laughs> overly surprising. Um... In the pictures, we see a lot of the secondary cast who we don't see, but I can't really place any names. I see a lot uh, of corridors. Oh. Um, and the final picture, uh, the lower right-hand corner, looks to be a monster made entirely of tinfoil. <laughs> well, at least it it's might, not bubble wrap. It might be in a corridor leading to Freddy's boiler room, but it's hard to tell. It actually looks like it's a corridor of the Starship Enterprise on red alert. Hmm. Ah. <laughs> that sounds it like a great name for a pub. Freddy's but you boiler have to room. admit... That looks like a tinfoil monster. It really did. 
And I'm, I'm trying to reopen the top right image to see what the insignia on that door is, but the page does not feel like cooperating the with my attempt to do it. The insignia is a circle with triangles in the shape of a circle in the center. Like four triangles, like slices of pizza in the center. Yeah, it's not a, a uh, symbol I'm familiar with. Not from this franchise, at least, yeah. The thing is, it's called the... There, is, there is another image with uh, what appears to be either Chinese or Japanese text. I was about to mention that, Bill. It's like it's interesting. It's okay. the La Verrier Space Station, which sounds French. Yet in this yeah. image, it looks like it's Chinese writing or Korean writing in the background. Well, Jean-Luc Picard has an English accent. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm sure there is many maybe, fan theories about because, that. Maybe because they figured they wouldn't follow a captain named Nog Nigel Oppington Smythe. I don't know. It does seem there is at least one Asian cast member. Yep, the guy there has uh, looks uh, Asian, but I can't tell. Maybe the French and maybe the French and the Chinese have gone into business together in this as a joint. I mean, when, when when I when I think of French and Asian together, my first thought is that it would be something from Vietnam, because there's it's, still a lot of uh, French speakers there, I believe. It's possible it could be Vietnamese. I'm not good. I know it's not Japanese. That's mm -hmm. pretty much the extent of my knowledge on air, on Asian characters. It doesn't even actually... that. Even mm -hmm. then, Japan. I mean, Japan frequently will just grab a Chinese character and use it as a word. So yes, even, I know. So even that doesn't uh, remove anything. Doesn't matter. All the pieces are probably made in Taiwan anyway. <laughs> French pieces, China, French pieces, Chinese pieces, all made in Taiwan! We use China and Taiwan in the same paragraph, so I'm expecting angry letters. The Chinese government will not appreciate that. This oh, I, podcast is now banned in China. Wah, wah, yeah, wah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Doctor Who is banned in China. So fair, fair point. Us talking about Doctor Who is illegal in China, so... We're probably already banned there. Mm. Yay, we're, if, if we're banned in a country, does that mean we've made the big time? <laughs> Look maybe at those can, criminals maybe, maybe talking we can about that on, the, on, our, on our website page. Now banned in X countries. Now banned oh, in China. I, I... Look at us, we're a bunch of badasses over here. <laughs> now banned in China and censored in Australia. Boy. Okay, so now that I've taken a mandatory crack at the Australian cent Board of Censorship, um, Dingoes ate my sister. They ate your baby. Okay, <laughs> so um, is anybody see anything else on these publicity photos that look interesting? I was trying to look to see if there's anything more to the insignias, but I'm not seeing anything. It's just a bunch of downward pointing arrows on a triangle. The technology does look vaguely Star Trekian, but only vaguely. Also, the helmets look vaguely like uh, the ones from Aliens, which is kind of adept uh, of the is that machine, the, the machine she's strapped to makes me think Total Recall, but I think it's... Which, which, which uh... Oh, oh uh, in he's the, talking about uh, one down, second one to row, right. second image. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> only with a lot more glowy blue fiber optics. Well, of course. It's Dr. Who, there must be glowy blue fiber optics. I'm sorry, anytime anyone says of course, it has to be of course. Of course, don't you know anything about science? No, 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 that's the Raul Julia M. Bison, of course, Matt. Although you did too high pitch, you're supposed to do it, of course! Matt, of I'm, course. Sitting, I'm sitting in a partially reclined cis position, I can't get the lungs to do a deep, of course. <laughs> okay, um, and then we have uh, the dude... Uh, in the lower right, who's apparently like the commander or something, maybe? Oh, the science guy? Yeah. Possibly. I think he's the one in the trailer who says they've uh, eliminated sleep, if I'm remembering the trailer properly. I think so, too. And apparently his name, his character name is Rasmussen. Huh. Interesting. 
there's a character in uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation by that last name who was who was a time traveler, who was also <laughs> a con artist, and was played by Matt Frewer, by the way. I remember that episode. Gotta love Matt Frewer. Anyway, um, since we've got not much else to say on this, I will move along. Um, even though we have no idea what its name is going to be, um, they have announced that the Doctor Who Christmas special is going to be shown in cinemas across the United States in late December. So, rejoice. Apparently, America loves its Doctor Who on the big movie screen. Fathom Yay. Events has announced uh, that the 2015 Christmas special uh, will be in theaters on December 28th and 29th at 7.30 p.m. local time. <clears throat> And will feature an exclusive interview with Alex Kingston and a 15-minute behind-the-scenes making of featurette starring Peter Capaldi, Stephen Moffat, and more. Of course, by the time that comes out, we have already will have given our review yeah. of the episode. Uh, I, was, the I was looking to see if Fathom Events uh, was going to potentially leak the name, but the page is up under the name Doctor Who Christmas Special 2015. Yeah. So they are not going to leak the name. Nope. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because they have a description of it in this. So they'll give us everything but the name of it. Uh, it's Christmas Day in the future, and the TARDIS is parked on a snowy village street covered in icicles awaiting its next adventure. Time traveler River Song meets her husband's new incarnation in the form of Peter Capaldi for the first time this Christmas. River Song made her first Doctor Who appearance in 2008 in Silence of the Library and Forest of the Dead and has appeared in 15 episodes to date. Um, Soma Shryaman, sorry, it's a hard name to pronounce. Yeah. Uh, Home Entertainment Licensing for BBC Worldwide North America said the return of River Song will be an incredible treat for Whovians heading to theaters in December to celebrate the holiday season with their Doctor Who community. Fathom Events CEO John Ruby said, The Doctor Who fans always come out to the movie theaters in full force, and we expect nothing less for this first ever big screen showing of the Christmas special. Experiencing this anniversary event as part of a community is the best kind of viewing party. I will actually agree with this. As someone who has gone to some of these Fathom Events Doctor Who specials, it is like going to a mini convention for two hours. Something many of you will also experience going to see Star Wars. I'm fairly certain. Woo! People are people. People mm. look at me and said, "Hi, Doctor." When I was there, dressed as uh, in my tenth Doctor suit. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciated that. Yes. Uh, I don't. Nor, 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 normally, I get that. Why are you dressed in a suit? Yes, but then you know, it's like. When I go to conventions, you know, it's you see these people and it's like these are my people. Yeah. This is where I belong. <laughs> mm. This is why I this is why I pars- this is why I, I staff a convention because that's the feeling I get when I'm there. And that's kind of a bit of the feeling I get when I go to these Doctor Who specials uh that Fathom Events puts out. Uh do they have a list of what theaters that they're uh going to air that in? Um. That's probably under. It, it's probably. I know if you go to buy tickets, it normally says that it's available in your area. I know the AMC theater near me tends to uh, offer tickets. Oh, tickets become available November 13, so I can't see that yet. Okay. A couple more days yet, and then you might be able to track it down. Yeah, I'm just making sure that Point Cinema is doing it because Point Cinema usually does. So it probably will. If 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 they did Day of the Doctor and there was a decent turnout, it's almost definite that they're going. They to They had to increase <laughs> showings for Day of the Doctor. <laughs> Where can they bog? More showings! More showings now! The look on the people at Point Cinema's face was, "Oh holy hell! What the fuck have we gotten ourselves into?" You've caught. We've put out the call to the Hoovians. The Hoovians have come. <laughs> Madison. Yes. Madison has a very large geek community, and um, we have a great many Doctor Who fans. So, be tripping scarves. Yes, they, they and they came out of in force for day, even though they had already seen it. 
and I'm pretty sure they came out in force for some of the other ones that I was unable to attend due to lack of fundage. I wonder if any of them showed up in, like, other sci-fi costumes. Oh, I'm sure a few did. Mm -hmm. Just I someone walking through I talking this Klingon. One I see at least one Doc Brown. <laughs> so, yep, be, be prepared to check to see if uh, Doctor Who is coming to your area in theaters. Interesting. I'm not Indeed. sure if we already knew this. But uh, just looking at their calendar, I'm showing that the Sherlock special will be in theaters on J January 5 and 6 as well. Huh. Huh. Well, um, anyway, uh, a new update uh, for Downtime. Downtime. Coke Media have now released a trailer for their forthcoming release of the unofficial Doctor Who spinoff from 1995, Downtime. It is a unique British 1995 sci-fi movie from the Doctor Who universe, but unofficial, featuring treasured characters and talent from the franchise and only now released on DVD. It's a must-see for the fans of the Time Lord. And we follow the Brigadier, Sarah Jane Smith, who investigates New World University, a sinister school run by Victoria Waterfield and Professor Travers. The technology-obsessed university holds a gateway to Earth made by classic foe, the Great Intelligence. Fighting alone this time, without their famous time-traveling scientific advisor, the Brigadier and Sarah Jane are hard-pressed to decide who is friend or foe is a search for a missing locus, which binds the intelligence's power. The battle is broadened when the Brigadier's own family is threatened, and Unit faces a powerful new breed of Yeti! Ah! What an eccentric performance. <laughs> By the way, speaking of downtime, I recently <laughs> found out that apparently there was a semi-sequel to this, oh. in which uh, Kate Lethbridge-Stewart had her second unofficial appearance, also from Real Time Pictures, by the name of Deimos Rising. Mm. Yeah, I, I remember hearing about that one. Hmm. Um, yeah, it but interesting the, the, from the, the little stills I saw. Yeah, the big news is, of course, that they actually released a trailer for it. Which means they're oh. still doing it. For downtime, I mean. I, I saw posts on Facebook saying viewed the trailer, but I just assumed it was the old trailer from when it came out on VHS. Nope, oh. they've, re they've released a new trailer. Downtime DVD trailer. They released it. It's new. It's news. They're still going ahead with it. So whatever claims that one person had, either they're either ignoring it or they have been okayed and greenlit through anyway. Or dealt with it out of court. That yeah. possibility, too. Shut up and take our money. Shut up here. Also, take that. Because there is a competition, because there is always a competition, to be in with a chance to win a copy of the DVD of Downtime, courtesy of Koch, Koch, uh, that thing, media. Simply answer the following question. Downtime also features roles for John Leeson and Jeffrey Beavers, but which characters are they better known for playing in Doctor Who itself? Please and send your answers. I will state right now, if you do not know the answer to this and you consider yourself a Doctor Who fan, particularly of classic media, um, you need to be smacked. <laughs> who here does not know who John Leeson and Jeffrey Beavers has played in Doctor Who? I don't Any, know. But... I'm terrible with names. I'd have to see faces first, and then I'd probably go, oh, that guy. Let me put it well, this way. One you would of them not, you wouldn't you... recognize. Actually, neither one of them you would recognize their face. True. At least not from Doctor Who. Okay, now, unless they're one of the rubber monsters. <laughs> Technically, you might consider that for Jeffrey Beavers. <laughs> um, but John Leeson's mo more known for his voice. John Leeson was a tinfoil not monster. Ah, okay. Hmm. I, see, I looked up John Leeson, and instantly I look over to the right and, oh, uh huh, <laughs> I see. I'll Again, I'm terrible with names. Later, I'm, it's, uh, how many times have I said this? I have dyslexia. I'm terrible with names. You know what? No, I'm actually, I'll actually spoil this for free for anybody who wants to listen to this and oh, enter with this. Of course. 
course. Okay. John yeah. Leeson is the voice of K-9. Jeffrey Beefers was the fourth Doctor era master. Mm-hmm. Like I said, so I, I don't know them by name. I know them by looking them up. <laughs> and it doesn't even take me ten seconds. I'm like, oh, right. Sadly, this is UK residents only. And I don't Damn. Ironically, or probably intentionally, the contest closes on Doctor Who's anniversary. Well, also, uh, uh, probably uh, it's UK only because I don't think they've actually confirmed a Region One release for that's, this. That, that, no, that's true. They have they have not as of yet. Another thing, uh, just so we don't forget, uh, send your answer to the question along with your name, address, and where you heard about the competition to comp-downtime at doctorwhonews.net with the subject, the internet is virally infected, exclamation point. Wow, they really have a sense of humor. And yes, so if, if you've heard it from us, state an unearthly podcast, please. We would love the publicity. Tip of the hat. Thank you very much. And next... All right, so uh, moving on to our next bit of information. Uh, Stephen Moffat and Peter Capaldi uh, have addressed rumors uh, of Series 10. I believe we referenced the fact uh, that there was a rumor that Series 10 would be either a shorter season or a split season. Uh, Stephen Moffat says it's not being reduced in size. We're not making fewer episodes. That's all complete bunk. I can confirm that absolutely. Uh, of the idea that Series 10 would be uh, a split season, Peter Capaldi says, not as far as I know. That's not what I've been told. That's not what I'm contracted for. Sorry, I'm not like Tim. I'm not going to do an accent for you. Uh, Capaldi, <laughs> Capaldi uh, and Moffat has, have also addressed the uh, scheduled uh, time period, which, as it's been recently, uh, is um, sh uh, immediately following Strictly Come Dancing. Uh, Capaldi says, I feel, it's, uh, I feel it's slightly used as a pawn in Saturday Night Warfare. I feel as if it should go out at 7.30 or around that time. I see a lot of kids and a lot of families, and these families who all love Doctor Who want to sit down and watch it together. Once you get past 8.15 p.m., you're getting yourself into adult territory. And although a lot of adults really like it, at its heart, it's designed to do a lot of entertaining of children as well. So I think it begins to move into a zone it doesn't quite belong in. I believe we actually uh, mentioned that in our comments of the ratings or of something related to that a few weeks ago. Uh, Moffat says on, uh, on the same topic, I don't think 825 is brilliant for Doctor Who. If there's a slight, and it's only a slight drop-off, it's, I think, that's not where Doctor Who is meant to be. Doctor Who is not designed and built to go out at 825 p.m. It's for earlier in the evening. We're doing fine once you put the consolidated, and then if you do the wicked thing that you're not supposed to do of adding on iPlayer as well, we're doing fine. I, which, that last part is complete bollocks to me because iPlayer is the modern way to view something like that. Hell, I'm sure. Yes, I, don't I know. know. But, I don't know about but, Britain, but the BBC I know hates that. In, in the states that don't even watch, that don't even own a yeah. television for that purpose anyway. The thing is, they, Bill, they BBC hates that. Bill, you got to remember their final ratings that they show always don't include iPlayer. So that's what he means by by the thing you're not supposed to do. Cuz yeah, do you remember the consolidated ratings are considered the fin the final ratings and then later on they'll post the final plus iPlayer. But um I kind of agree with Moffat on this. 825 is a little late for Doctor Who. I would actually put Strictly Come Dancing a little later and put Doctor Who in front of it. Yes. If I was the BBC. I would rather have it on... It should go on at, at 7.30, but I would rather have it at 5.30 than 8.15. Or at 5.30 than 8.30, you know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's okay, almost putting... That, that, was reg that was regarding the, uh, the Series 8 and 9 time as apparently Series 10... Um, Moffat says, I don't know when it goes out, that's up to someone else, and even if I did know, which I genuinely don't, I wouldn't be allowed to say so, as I have absolutely no say in it whatsoever. Um, that's, um, n yeah, that's actually talking about the transmission date, not the transmission time. Oh, that is the date, oh, that's the date, sorry, okay. Yard. Um, Red yep, the, 
because it's mentioning that production's not likely to begin until May due to the um, new uh, spin-off series class. So Doctor Who is already hitting the production crunch that was hitting when they were doing um, Torchwood and Doctor Who at the same time. God help them if they added a third show. I was going to say, at least not. Yeah, at least it's not three shows at once. Mm-hmm. Now that now they now they announced that uh, Captain Jack will be doing a, a new series in which he and Maisie Williams alternate between dying. <laughs> Special guest on the first episode, Kenny from South Park. <laughs> Titled the new show "Dead Like Me." Oh wait. <laughs> That would be the ultimate crossover. The cat, they get the gas from dead like me to come make, to come make the claim. It's like, oh, it's you. <laughs> so is that all we have to say about that? I think so. I think and that's right all I have mind. to say about that. All right. So after last year's design for a Doctor Who Christmas card went over well, the Doctor Who Appreciation Society has released a new one for the 2015 season, Aww. the profits of which will be donated to the Tiggy Winkles Wildlife Hospital Trust, <laughs> whose vice president is uh, Colin Baker, the sixth doctor himself. Huh. Wow. Um. You can actually, if you saw the news article, you can actually see what it looks like there. You yes, can see it's it. adorable. <laughs> we got you scars, bow ties, it? guitars. Yes, you got P Capaldi's guitar right in front. You oh, got there's the glasses doctor's... down there at the bottom. And you've got the second doctor's recorder down there, too. Mm-hmm. That's fairly awesome. There's a little blue thing over there. I'm not sure what it is. Oh, it's the uh, the crystal, the Metabilis three crystal. Oh, okay. There's our third Doctor reference. Nice. Is there a stick of celery someplace? <laughs> Can we zoom in and... further on this thing? Um, Control plus. You could might you might also be able to right click and save picture. And view it in something separately where you can zoom in. I don't see celery, so I don't see a fifth doctor reference. I don't. Yeah, I don't see a cricket bat. <laughs> I, and I and even though it's for the the society six doctor, I don't see a six doctor reference either. No, I don't see a cat. I don't see a rainbow. <laughs> I think I think of the two, Colin would have preferred the cat. Yeah, I do get that. And I, I see the beginning of the question mark umbrella handle. Yeah, I'm not sure I where guess. the rest of it went. Just kind of sitting there in the background. There's a guitar, a recorder, sunglasses, which go with the guitar. But and course. there and there should and there should be a, a pair of red Converse. I can't. I don't. I can't tell if that's a fez or a red present with a bow on top. Not sure. Or maybe like a red present just made to look kind of like a fez. Anyway, next these, the guitar. Anyway, yeah. These cards are A5 size and can be purchased worldwide. Full details can be found at the Doctor Who Appreciation Society website. That's uh, mm -hmm. www.wasw. DWASonline.co.uk. For whatever reason, my tongue would not say that. Speaking of buying things, the BBC store launched in the United Kingdom. The BBC store, which is launched by the BBC, is a new online shop aiming to open up a wealth of archive material, both old and new, to viewers in the United Kingdom to buy and keep digitally. Oh. Yes, this was kind of the thing that we were ta discussing a few weeks ago about the BBC kind of making their own net Netflix-like thing. Um, Netflix or Steam? Kind of. It's it, it works like Netflix um, in, the, in how it uh, streams media, but mm -hmm. probably it's closer to Steam in how its shop works. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of thinking, too. 
and so they'll either let you. So scream basically, the program. exact sort of thing that I've been trying, that I've, uh, well, not exact, but kind of close to what I've been hoping Big Finish would do in doing some yes. sort of online streaming. And if you're a Doctor Who fan, the launch makes all nine series of the modern era available to purchase, either as each complete series or individual episodes, with the current series being added to as they are broadcast. Nice. The animated adventure The Infinite Quest is also available for purchase, and for the nice. classic era, there are currently an editorial selection available to represent each Doctor. Cool. Sure. Yeah, this is going to take a while to get all the stuff in there. Yeah. Does it say anything about whether this is available outside the UK? Uh, it does not. It just says uh, only available to the UK. Okay, so only or, only in the UK right now. It might be expanded later. Yeah. It'll be expanded later if it they're, takes they're, off they're, really well in the UK. They're still getting it built, and they're still working on rights issues in other countries, I'm sure. Yeah, probably. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It says I prices can there. range from... Uh, 1.89 pounds for single episodes to 21.99 pounds for series nine. Uh, um, this, that would be this one said, pound. I do have to pence, say, I feel. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. What were you saying? I was just saying that that would be one pound eighty nine pence would be how it would go, how it would be said. By the way. Ah. All right. One pound. I will keep that in mind. Now this this does probably mean that uh, Netflix in the UK is probably taking a hit. Because anything available oh, yeah. on this is probably getting pulled from Netflix UK. Uh, probably not the new series. Um, because they're just kind of distributing that universally. At least at the moment, because they're not about to break their contracts. Because there's probably some defaulting issues in there. True, but, ne but Netflix renews their contracts, it seems, every year or so. Oh. Yes, I know, but they're under, I think, a two-year or three-year contract right now. They just renewed... Um, the, I think this summer for like a two or three year contract. Or, the, yeah, or they may keep something like one through eight on Netflix and then nine and ten you have to go to the BBC shop for. So just to let you all know, I've looked up the dollar prices and the dollar prices are actually wouldn't be too bad in America. It's about 34 bucks a season US and That's it's bad. about 34 bucks a season. Yeah, considering that it's uh, actually no, that's not that bad because the season no, box. No, no, what are you talking, Patty? It's like fifty bucks a box set. No. Now I'm curious how how they treat series four and series seven. And it's about uh, three bucks an episode. And mm -hmm. it has a very limited selection of classic Who right now, but that may change in the future depending on demand. Yeah. Obviously they're Seventh not put Doctor, up everything. all except for one of his most popular episodes and another random episode. Oh, actually, Resurrection of the Dollars, Dalek suffers the same problem, so I wonder if it's a uh, an issue with the Terry Nation estate. Yarg. Uh, that wouldn't be for uh, the other episode is Paradise Towers, and that has nothing well, to do with Terry Nation. No, but I mean, I mean. Uh, Destiny of the Daleks, Resurrection, and Remembrance are among those that are not available at this time. It's possible, mm -hmm. or it could be rights with Terry Malloy. Mm. Is, uh... Uh, and well, the Eighth Doctor movie, of course, because now BBC has the full rights to that now. At least it's gone to somebody who's not going to abuse it. Yeah. Alright, is there anything more to say about this? Not much I else. I don't think that. so just yet. 33 uh, bucks is too much for a season. I have to compare it to uh, Amazon prices, but mm. um, that I'm moves sure us on like to bucks. our Big Finish news. Uh, now, Big Finish, our main news right now is two releases that I think we had both announced last week were coming, so I don't want to spend too long on them. We have Unit Extinction, uh, which features the modern unit crew versus Nick Briggs as the Nestine Consciousness, because, of course, Nick Briggs is the only person who can play an alien in the UK, apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, the next unit box set will be the five-disc set in May of 2016 by the name of Unit Shutdown. 
and they uh, intend to continue with two additional box sets, uh, one every six months following that. So plenty coming for uh, unit fans, and they do remind us that this is uh, among what is ne well was not when this was announced, but is now a plethora of new who releases. At this point, there being one, two, three, four, four between this and the next unit set, as of what we know of so far. With it being entirely possible that there will be new ones announced in between now and May. Uh, the other new release is Jago and Lightfoot and Strax. Uh, yeah, Jago and Lightfoot and Strax. The crossover between the uh, Fourth Doctor supporting characters and Twelfth Doctor, Eleventh Doctor supporting characters. Uh, Jago and Lightfoot, of course, is one of Big Finish's apparently most popular uh, Doctor Who spinoffs. And they uh, seem to be going uh, with no with no slowing in momentum. Although this is the only special they have announced of theirs so far, and it also falls under the big finish new Who umbrella. And of course, uh, we don't cover the uh, series nine Saturdays every week because the sales end before we come to air. But I just want to remind everyone that uh, every Saturday, as uh, new Who comes out. Big Finish does tend to do at least one, uh, sometimes several items on sale. This week it was all of their Zygon related, uh, or at least several Zygon related stories. So if you're, a, you know, if you have the money for Big Finish and you are uh, want things related to what you're seeing in Series Nine, don't forget to check out BigFinish.com every Saturday. Okay. So, moving on to a piece of science fiction news we should have reported last week, but we were too busy being stoked on a uh, new Star Trek being announced that we forgot to mention it, is the uh, Star series Ash vs. Evil Dead, which premiered on Halloween, has already been renewed for its second season by Stars, And it was actually renewed three days before the first episode even aired. Um, nonetheless... Um, Ash vs. Evil Dead Episode 1 has generated very high ratings. I believe it had a 98% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, people that have seen the second episode have reported to me that it's even better than the first episode. So, Stars oh. looks like it has a hit on its hands. A huge one, which Oof. I will buy the DVD as soon as possible after I also get my Michael Myers costume back in order. <laughs> Ash vs. Evil Dead, of course, stars Bruce Campbell as Ashley J. Williams, the hero from the Evil Dead Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness, and is produced by Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi, who directed that first episode. Nice. Yeah. It also is going to have Lucy Lawless uh, later in the series as somebody uh, trying to hunt down Ash for being responsible for the entire situation, which is technically true. Kind of, sort of. At well, least he read the words. At, at, the other people responsible are already dead. And he is kind of responsible for the recent resurgent in activity. Yep. And um, it's a really good one. If you have stars and you like the, uh, the uh, horror comedy genre, um, this really is a show for you as Evil Dead basically invented that genre. Uh, before Sam Raimi and Evil Dead, horror and comedy were considered mutually exclusive terms. He Unless proved you were that it, Costello. Yeah. Yeah, but really, those didn't go over that well. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. a couple of them that went pretty well. But that's far in between. Mm -hmm. Really, really, that was comedy with just a touch of horror. But um, Sam Raimi was the first to actually make it a thing. And really, without that, we wouldn't have things like Buffy and other stuff in that same style of genre. Mind you, of course, Sam Raimi also knows how to make it extra cheesy. That's what we expect for Sam. So, if you like that kind of stuff, this is a show for you. It's on Stars. If you don't have Stars, you'll have to wait to, till it comes out on DVD, but this is probably a must-grab for you. And it from sounds what like we're Tim hearing. crashed. Or... Yep. Oh, no, I'm here. Uh, Bill crashed, then. Okay, well then, we're going to take a couple minutes here and hopefully get Bill back. Uh, we're going to uh, we're gonna discuss a couple of uh, new releases in the video game community. As uh, many might know, um, 
Activision Blizzard put out their uh, latest expansion for StarCraft II, which is a uh, colossal, you know, hit for the Activ for Blizzard. Um, and that would be uh, uh, the expansion dealing largely with the Protoss race. Yep. I had that news article up on what that particular expansion was called, but I erased Legacy it. Legacy of the Void. Legacy of the Void. Thank you. Um, any of you heard anything about the uh, the expansion at all? Um, I've mm. seen one video of Toll Biscuit and Jesse Cox doing stuff sponsored by Blizzard because they are both Blizzard fanboys. They were doing WoW videos before WoW videos were cool. Um, they seem to be enjoying it. They were doing some versus PC special stuff. Mm. Okay. Um, and then, of course, uh, Bethesda Studios released mm. Fallout 2. Bethesda is the company responsible for the Elder Scrolls series, including Skyrim. Fallout 2? Fallout 4, excuse me. I'm looking at StarCraft 2. <laughs> yeah, Fallout 4, released Fallout 4 both yesterday. I've been playing Fallout 4 on and off for the last 24 hours, and it is a beautiful, beautiful game. I mean, literally, uh, Aaron and I were sitting down and watching the sunset, and it was beautiful. <laughs> for those of you that don't know what the Fallout series is about, it is an alternate universe in which uh, American society stagnated after the 1950s. Um, resulting I thought you in, said it was alternate society. Um, I'm I pretty sure. Because uh, we don't have as much as the better red than dead mentality, that they, or better dead than red mentality that they had. And... Um, mm -hmm. It all it all uh, results in uh, a nuclear war in the 2070s, and the game takes place 200 years after that. Oh. Uh, uh, Fallout 3 took place around Washington D.C. Its uh, side spin-off game, Fallout New Vegas, took place in the Nevada desert, and uh, this one takes place around Boston. So um, it's a new area that's not been covered by the Fallout universe, but this game is awesome. It has a new highly involved crafting system that allows you to scout, scavenge materials from pretty much anything on the board. Uh, the combat system has been revamped to be smoother. Um, you still have uh, the VAT system, which is their way of uh, specialty targeting, although it's not quite as slow as the original. And um, almost every weapon in the game is customizable, moddable, and so is most of your armor. So it's really, really cool. And they actually treat power armor like power armor and not like a suit of armor you wear around. By the way, just got an image. I'm not sure if it's going through Skype. Skype has been kind of laggy today. I see that. Um, what is this image? It's a comparison of the power armor between 3 and 4. Yeah, it's um, an absolute beautiful... Well, not just the external, how it's used, I mean. Well, um, I'm, it's, I'm talking it's, just visuals. It's already an impressive change. Yes, but I mean, in, in Fallout 3, you put on a suit of armor. You have to have a perk to use it, and you just walk around like it's another piece of armor. Here, you put it on, and you actually have to watch yourself put it on in a bizarre way, and you get this new HUD and everything. It's quite amazing. It's a beautiful game. It's essentially post-apocalyptic Iron Man. Yeah, it really is. It's, mm. it's really awesome. It's always how I expected power armor would actually feel. Mm -hmm. um, and another, uh, since we have a few more minutes, uh, Tim, you said you went to go see the Peanuts movie. Yes, uh, I have been a humongous Charlie Brown and Snoopy and Linus and Lucy fan. Uh, ever since I was a, a wee, wa wee little lad, so I uh, I went to see this movie. I haven't been to the movies as often as I would like, like, but I knew I had to see this one at least, along with the Star Wars movie, of course. <laughs> of course. Of course. And... And overall, I did enjoy it. I was, I was thinking to myself, this is a, as good a fan movie as you could hope for. Or 
in that my, my big uh, concern was going in was is it right to make a peanuts movie without the input of charles schultz yeah that was kind of a turnoff for me schultz. Well, but I, I i thought well the people who made this movie they didn't know the characters as well as schultz would have but i got the feeling that this was still made out of a place of love and respect for these characters so i i i give them props for that well, oh. uh, here's the thing too and i know i'm not sure how well it went off but i do know that I, as far as i can tell this is the prob probably the same studio that also made a tv series out of the peanuts not too long ago and i'm i'm kind of surprised it got popular enough that it got a movie all this sudden too so i'm kind of figuring obviously they hit something right mm -hmm. yeah. schultz or not I, I i don't know if it's the same company or not um I know um, Howard Taylor didn't think the film met his uh, um, his level of uh, it was just below uh, his uh, cutoff for being awesome, but hmm. like I said, it was just below that. Hmm. Um. See, this is being put out by Blue Sky Studios. Um, and no, that, this is their, this is their first, uh, foray into Peanuts. Okay. So it's not the same people. I, I did notice a lot of, jo like, inside jokes that only a Peanuts fan would get throughout the movie. Hmm. Like, like, or, or only people, like, who, who read the comic strip. Uh, like every one and has has it memorized. For example, there's this scene where Snoopy goes into his doghouse and he's like looking for something, and you see him like throw all of these objects. And one of them is a copy of S the Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh, and that Ooh. is a reference to like something in the Peanuts comic strip, how Snoopy was always talking about who he had a Van Gogh in his in his house. Okay. Uh, by the way, this is the company that produced the original Ice Age movies. Oh. Okay. Uh, it also did Rio and Epic and Rio 2. So they've done some really good stuff already. So yeah. Yes. I, I, I totally trust these guys to make a decent Peanuts movie. All right, so you you would say that this is a definite go to see, right? All right, do we have Bill back? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was, he's I was been gone, he's I was been quiet this minute. I just head. haven't had anything to contribute while uh, during the most recent discussion. Yeah, we just wanted to make sure you're back because now we're moving on to the five minute challenge. Mm -hmm. Who wants to do the five minute challenge? I did last week. Yes, I know you did. I would prefer not to do it because, I, to be honest, I'd actually like to go get a glass of water because I ate some spicy sushi right before this uh, cast, <laughs> and it's starting to burn my tongue. <laughs> so, Bill, Tim, either of you want to do the five-minute challenge? Huh. Tim only does what he's feeling brave enough, and Bill, I, you should I, have yeah, I, I, ready. Yeah, I'd prefer to prepare in advance, because you know how I am with linear time when I don't prepare. Well, I am not prepared, yes, but... but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, are, you, are you sure do you want to do it, Bill? Or uh, Tim? Wow. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd rather have Tim do it than Aaron, because I think... Uh, Hers, I think, was the only five-minute challenge that actually made me angry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. That's because she was pretty much trying to hit every possible thing to make she you was... twitch. Really? Yes, I, I, ha I haven't done one to make you want to kick me in the dick yet? I no. I guess I can no. work on that. No, she was, <laughs> deliberately, she was deliberately trolling it. Which is why we need to force her to do it again, just so she's forced to, just against her will. <laughs> 
I really do not want to have the police called for domestic abuse. I really don't. <laughs> All right. Are you ready, Tim? I uh, believe I am not ready, but I'll go anyway. <laughs> All right, All right. I'll, I'll, I'm going to leave you guys to it. I'm going to quickly go get uh, some water before oh. I die. Jeez. All right, Betty Boop operation starting in five, four, three, two, one, go. So Clara wakes up in her room, and uh, she can't read because it's all gobbledygookity, and the toothpaste says, this is toothpaste, and then she turns on the TV and she sees what uh, Bonnie is seeing uh, when Bonnie is looking through the scope of her bazooka, and uh, she, 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 she shakes the TV, set and that makes her miss, and, and then uh, uh, it, it reverses time, and, the, 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 and, and she's like, she bites her finger, and then... The you don't have to and, do and, and then the plane gets blown up and and, and then Bonnie's going around uh, forcing uh, Zygons to disguise as humans to be uh, not human and uh, then uh, uh, she she tries to figure out where is the Osgood box and she goes to the place where the Osgood, she thinks the Osgood box is. And she gets a recorded message from the two Osgoods saying, Ha ha, it's not here. And and uh, she goes back to where Clara is being kept in her pod. And she, she feels her pulse. pulse and uh, she says, Ha ha, since we are linked, I, I, I can feel my pulse to know if you're lying to me. So where's the Osgood box? And Clara says, Okay, it's in the Tower of London. And it's like, give me access to it. And I says, I can't give you access to it. And then Clara says, and then Bonnie says, aha, I know because I already have access to it. And, and meanwhile, the the doctor and uh, Osgood have survived their plane being blown up by the use of parachutes. Good old parachutes. And they're wandering around and they say, oh, we, we have to get to the, to, to the, the place. And... To, to to unit headquarters and then the uh <laughs> and uh, uh then they 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 and they and they're unit headquarters and they, and they run into uh to to Kate Lethbridge Stewart Stewart and uh Kate Lethbridge Stewart is uh, apparently uh, 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 it, it's apparently a Zygon D disguised as Kate Lurgan Stewart, and it says, like, uh, the, 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 the Kate says, uh, Doctor, we have to take you to the place. And <laughs> and the doctor says, Oh, that's convenient. We were looking for the place. And, <laughs> and, and uh, then uh, it's revealed that Kate Lurgan Stewart is Lurgan Stewart. Uh, that she she got away from her attacker in New Mexico with that with the handy use of five rounds rapid and then the uh, and the question everyone on everyone's mind is why is it called the Osgood box and and it's revealed that it's called the Osgood box because there are two of them uh, a red one and a, and a blue one and it, it, it opened up the lid, and there, there's a, there are two buttons on them. One says truth, and one says consequences. And and then it, it, the standoff is like saying, all right, if you press one button, uh, and, and all, all the, the Zygons will be killed. And and then if you press another button, all the Zygons uh, will, uh, will become Zygons again. Again. And then for another box... Uh, it's uh, revealed that, uh, like, uh, you, you'll blow up uh, unit headquarters or, or something, I think, and uh, and another button, the, the option is all the Zygons will be permanently trapped in human form. So they'll have to live their lives as uh, human beings. And, uh, and uh, Bonnie and uh, Kate says, well, w which is which? And the doctor says, I'm not going to tell you. And then they say, and then it's revealed that the boxes do absolutely nothing because they're empty. And it, 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 it's, a, it's this big uh, thing. It's like, aha, 
and the and the doctor goes into this big speech about this was my plan all along, like to to show you that this big convoluted lesson about the nature of war and destruction, and you know how you 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 can never be sure. Uh, c c war is bad. Is what I'm saying. And uh, then uh, Kate uh, Stewart's memory gets erased, and Bonnie says, "Oh well, I think I'll be a good person now." And so, so uh, Bonnie uh, decides to become another, uh, the second Osgood once more. And so the two Osgoods go off to uh, safeguard the empty boxes and maintain the peace between Zygons and humans. And also, uh, Clara uh, is alive now, and the doctor and her go off in, in the TARDIS, which stands for Totally and Radical Driving in Space. Uh, the end. You did it in five and a half minutes. Oh. Just a wee bit over. Just a wee bit. Well, I okay. think I improved from the last time I did it. Yes, and I thank you for doing that, and so does my tongue. <laughs> okay. So, lesson learned. Sushi with chili oil continues to have the heat build even after you eat it. <laughs> Someone can't handle their spice. Oh, shut up. <laughs> also, another lesson learned from this episode. War is empty. If he could control his spice, he would control the universe. <laughs> War. War never changes. War. Sorry. War never changes. They actually didn't have him doing the voice this time. But what? Uh, it's because they had the, the main character's voice do it. Uh Anyway, so things that you liked. Oh, close this and bring up the pictures. Oh, so I'm usually first. Yes, yes, you are. Oh, so things that I liked. Um, if you want, I could start rolling a D three or a D four. <laughs> it would actually be almost interesting to roll or die and see who randomly ends up being picked. But, um... That's for another time, because I have to yeah. remember to get my dice out of the car. That'll be for another time. Or we could do a dice roller. Anyway. Um... Oh, something in general. Um, I really like the no waste of pace in this one. Mm -hmm. There's not a moment spared. Everything went on to build up to something. I think that's what you said last week. Was that what I said last week? I think it was. Well, then they did it really good throughout the whole multi-part, then. They didn't waste a single moment, and it was a nice build-up again to a big finale. Probably one of the better finales we've had this year, too. Yeah, Bill usually says that some of these two-parters are t are a bit too long and should have been, like, you know, a 90-minute special. Well, I don't see I, that. I, I, don't... I, tend, I tend to prefer the two-parter length, but it does, it does happen sometimes. Like, that's how I felt with uh, Under the Lake uh, Before the Flood. I don't see that here. Right. We, we had a fantastic <clears throat> leaving off with last episode, and we had a great finisher for this one. And the, and the pacing was pitch perfect for both episodes. All right. So I guess that's my bit. Uh, Bill? <clears throat> I... Are you are you dying over there, Randy? Are you burning? I I, 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 sw I swallowed down the wrong pipe. Excuse me. Ah. <laughs> I'm Go going ahead, to Bill. I'm Keep going, going to Bill. say, with one exception, the dialogue between Bonnie and Clara. I'm going to say it was it was it was, it was pretty, okay. pretty, pretty pretty snappy and consistent throughout the episode. A good ongoing thread, with the only downside being that I'm surprised if Clara does not know how to fool a lie detector test. So there's going to be a uh, scene that we don't like coming from you, Bill, then I take it? Quite possibly. I haven't quite settled on everything I'm going to say, but it's possibly the one. Well, she's only Mary Sue up to a point. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So, Tim? 
I thought this uh, episode showed much improvement from the first part in that it was a lot, it seemed a lot less convoluted and easier to uh, digest personally for me. That uh, I, I wasn't always uh, trying to figure out who was who uh, when I was watching it. Because the uh, last, uh, the first part of this uh, story seemed uh, awful. Like they really seemed to be milking like the who is human, who is Zygon. You never know. Like you're trying to like always stay once up ahead of the game. But this episode, it, it seemed like it was that that didn't seem as pressing. That you could just sit back and enjoy the episode for itself. That's because all the manic planning of the enemy monsters this week, uh, this week have already gone off, and now it's the aftermath. Well, that makes sense. Yep. So it's a little less harder to uh, follow because we've already gotten all of our twists, and now it's mm -hmm. the follow-through. For the most part, most of our twists. I... Alright. So what I really liked is the whole... Feel, the... Um... The bits that they really had, where they really st showed the fact that there was a, that this was, you know, one group versus another group, and there was a bunch of people caught in the middle, like the one poor Zygon that was infected that was infected to change back, and all he wanted to do was be left alone. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing, that that kind of bit that you can really see that war really has does have the innocent bystanders that get yeah caught in the crossfire. Can can I just say with that scene, I really got the vibe that the Men in Black should have been walking around uh, neuralizing people. That happened. That you, happened after the scene was over. You 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 did not see a man begin to turn into an alien covered in suckers. You will go home and cherish your family, and and return to this store once the shopkeeper has fixed everything. <laughs> once cleanup is done. You did. You did not see him. Yeah, you did not see a half man, half sucker creature run down this road. You did not see him electrocute blast a, a, somebody, somebody into a wall. <laughs> you will go home and watch Strictly come dancing, and God think it's it. the greatest oh, thing God. ever. <laughs> it's the British Men in Black. There you go. Go, go home and watch Strictly come dancing, you monster. Well, it reminds me of that, that there's an episode of Helsinger Bridge where he hypnotizes the, uh, the guy behind the desk of a hotel. It's like, you want to give me the penthouse suite. I want to give you the penthouse suite. And you want to throw out Chevy Chase because he's an asshole. And I want to throw out Chevy Chase because he's an asshole. Yes, and watch this. And he'll do anything I say. Watch this. White Chicks was amazing. White Chicks was amazing. And, and he, he believes, believes it, too. Too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that's, that's that whole kind of, you know, mind-dominant thing. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trust the British men in black not to do that. That would explain a lot of reality TV, now that I think about it. <sighs> At least it's not the Margaret Thatcher era. All right, things we you don't like, not trust Matt. the British men in black then. Things in general. I did not like. Um... Uh, honestly, I'm not really coming up with anything at the moment. Pass. So pass for now, yeah. Unless I come up with something. Bill? I feel like I might have had something in mind and got derailed by the conversation. <clears throat> um, Dang it. Just a second. Hmm. Um, honestly, not sure if I have something for this. All right. Take a pass for now? Yeah. That's half a pass by the group. Tim? So, uh, what are we on again? Things you don't like, in general. Oh. I thought I already did. No, you did oh, things you did thing like. The thing you like. Oh, uh, the, the things I don't like. Huh. Okay, so, uh, uh, 
One thing I didn't like uh, was the doctor's obsession with which one are you? Which one are you? Because that's a good point. Yeah, that that um, I should have yeah. said. Yeah, because Still. if there's any if there's anyone who wouldn't give a darn about that, it would be the doctor. It would be the doctor. It's not necessarily because of a societal thing. It's more of I need to know what your abilities are. Mm. Mm. Still. Oh, but I mean, like, it, it harkens back to, I mean, the first time that topic got brought up, it was, which one's the real one? They both are. Yes, but human or Zygon? Doctor doesn't answer. And then it just goes on to now all of a sudden the doctor is the one that keeps asking. Even when, now even, even when the situation has passed and it no longer matters, he's still asking. Hmm. Yeah, when they were in the midst of the situation, it could have been just more like, what are your abilities, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would be like, can you zap people? Yeah. Although I think they need to normalize to do that. Did anyone zap anybody all in human form? Not that I'm aware of. I think the half Zygon could zap people, but he was still half Zygon at the time. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that obsession, once the crisis was over, was a little odd. So things I didn't like in general. If I had to hear the words truth or consequences one more time, <laughs> I was going to go off and smack somebody. <laughs> oh, I'm going to give you that, such that a That actually pitch. ties into what I am actually going to say for my least favorite scene. It, is like, it is like the writer. Uh, what was his name again? Uh, Peter Harness. Peter Harness looked at a map and said, oh, my God, there's a town called Truth or Consequences. I'm going to write an episode based around that theme. It was seriously. Actually, that was like, prob I would not be surprised if that was in the brief that Moffat gave him because it feels like this is something that's been kind of planned since 2013. So that much might have been in the brief. It might not have been, but it might have been. Because everything from from the motto of the Zygon Revolution to the buttons on the Devi on the Osgood boxes, everything was truth or consequences, and I'm just like, uh, we get it. Can I get you know, hit? Any that's what any the, the Zygon should have been relocated somewhere else. Uh, probably not to uh, one of those towns named Hell, because I can't imagine that would have gone well. But I'm sure there's a town with a nice, innocuous, peaceful name where we could have put the Zygons and they would have become peaceful people. It's been a quiet week in Lake Gulbagon, my hometown. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that actually reminds me of something that is unrelated that I'm going to ask you, that I'm going to ask, ask you after the podcast. If I don't forget. It's been a quiet week in Lake Titicaca. No, if if you don't know, um, there is a radio host by the name of Garrison Keeler, whose big thing is that he does uh, this whole bit about his fictional hometown of Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, which is out, supposed to be outside of Saint Cloud. That he calls the little time that the little town that time forgot, and he does that. He that's how he starts his narrative every week on his show. Is it's been a quiet week in Lake Lobagon, my hometown. <laughs> so I, I'm actually seeing that tied in with this, where you discover half the residents of Lake Lobagon were actually Zygons. I'm I'm very amused by this concept. It may become fan fiction. <laughs> okay. We'll do a chapter a year. So, scene that you like. Is that a dig at my fan fiction, Bill? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that 10 second response time. <laughs> it's because my mind was already on one track. It took a moment to it was, for it to switch. To, to, to be fair, it's a comment you normally would have made. Yes, I thought I was supposed to be the asshole on this show. <laughs> Keep firing, assholes! Apparently you've never met me. <laughs> Seriously, when I, I got the... I said across her when nose, I, not up it! When I got the casting billing for an unearthly podcast, it said wanted, pretentious, know it all asshole, and I said, okay, I'm in. I think at the time we had about three. 
Yeah, <laughs> it was basically three pretentious know-it-all assholes talk about Doctor Who. That would have been a great name for a podcast. Jeez, we should have done that. <laughs> pretentious assholes talk about Doctor Who. But, but, then, but then what would have Matt and Thomas been? I don't know, but Tim's obviously our comic relief. <laughs> that, yeah. He's also our Shakespearean trained actor. Matt waffles between the roles on occasion. True. Uh, that's because I'm always a middle guy. I can one day be the complete total asshole, the other day I'll be the that's heavenly true. saint Com- that blesses everything that passes the role through. That's rotated out the most. That was, I was actually trying to sit here and actually think if we actually had credits at the end of the show, what they would be. And Bill would be listed as the host. I would be the pretentious one. Tim would be the goofy one. I don't know. The pretentious one feels like that should be the job for the English major or film student of the sort that uh, you used to argue with every week. <laughs> Yes, but we don't have that, so I have... We don't so have I that have... currently, right. We love you, Flynn. <laughs> if you're listening. We love you, we, Flynn, we, wherever we, you we, are. We, 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 we miss mm. fighting with you, Flynn. We miss hating you. <laughs> Gave us something to talk about every uh, week. Where were we, though? Um, <laughs> we were beginning we were things... To start our favorite scenes, that... I think. Favorite scenes, yes. Oh, God, you're handing me favorite scenes first. I'm yes. probably going to steal this from everybody. The final speech before they can give up on the Osgood boxes. Yep, that was mine. Yeah, I, I, I generally, I generally, if it's a doctor's speech, I assume that Ren has dibs, so I don't say it anyway. I, I need to actually go back and watch it again. Yep, I got to take a few buckets of lava and toss it down Matt's mind now. Oi, that's your <laughs> mind too. <laughs> Do you want any more diamonds or not? Hey, there's no better sort of rage than self-destructive rage. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be the quintessential version of what he's about to try and commit. Bye, Randy. I'm going to go off to the north and great and find myself a new base full of diamonds <laughs> and hookers. Matter of fact, forget the diamonds. <laughs> I don't know. Considering the fact that every, th- every creature in Minecraft looks like Squidward... I wouldn't want a hooker. Just saying. You never know what you're going to find out there. Especially All right. Mod it. So Matt's is the, the epic, what I referred to as the epic Time War speech in the channel earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, which I actually saw had surprise at seeing because I thought we were past epic Time War speeches. Only unless it's going to be meaningful. I, this one was. I, 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 I think Russell left a clause in the contract that uh, there had to be one per season after he left. <laughs> <laughs> you can't forget the time war. Stamp. Because, you know, I thought Day of the Doctor kind of put an end to those, but yeah, no. Nope. I think Got we surprised. had one in deep breath or close to it. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, so, so Bill. Zombie, then? Yep, it's I'm you next. Thinking, I'm thinking the uh, the Sonic Specs scene. With uh, Osgood kind of analyzing the Doctor and their back and forth. I'm not sure how I feel about the Basil part of it, but the rest of that scene I, enjoy, I liked. <laughs> it okay. stands out to me. It's obviously him going tongue-in-cheek. Oh, yeah, obviously. That's not, I'm pretty sure... If they would not reveal his real name that way, and that wouldn't be it. Especially be something... after the last few seasons. There'd be more than a few reasons to lynch Moffat. <laughs> Especially if it wasn't something at least as long and complicated as uh, Romana's full name. All right. Um, Tim, your favorite scene? That could be Maxel. Okay, so uh, this is my second favorite scene because my first favorite scene was taken. But huh. uh... By who? By who? Uh, it was the, 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 the speech. Okay, so pretty me. much all of us had the speech, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I also liked uh, the uh, the Bonnie-Clara interrogation scene when they just face off. Damn it, and... that was my number two. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't throw lava down his mine shaft. Or can you? Uh, no, the more times that's repeated, the more it sounds like a double entendre. 
Oh my. Oh my. <laughs> Shut up, Takei. Okay, do you have anything more you need, want to say about that, Tim? I just uh, thought it was uh, very well uh, acted by uh, by Claire and Bonnie. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that leaves me with my third favorite scene, which would be Osgood and Osgood at the end of the episode. Also you, a choice. You also see that. You see them go off. It's like, let's go off and make a whole bunch of, in, of big finish audios. <laughs> Seriously, that's what it felt like. Hey, big finish. Shh, you're spoiling the announcement for next week. Don't. <laughs> Actually, we already knew that she was uh, she was working with Big Finish. No, but I mean, could you just imagine the, an Osgood range being announced? I mean, now we have her. I mean, I don't know if they'd call her call it Patronella Osgood, but Osgood and Bonnie, Osgood and Osgood, the Osgood sisters. I don't know what you call the Osgoods. Them. Osgood yeah, Squared? Yeah, that could work, the Osgoods. Osgood Squared, ah, uh, maybe. Although, no, no, the Osgoods, that just, that goes wrong places to me, because that just makes me think of the Osbournes. <laughs> Sharon! Sharon! <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so, um, scenes you didn't like. Matt. Uh, <laughs> um... I guess the only one I can think of, and this is a, this is me really searching for a nitpick, is when the um, the authority figures show up after the airplane crash, and they're just staring at the doctor and Oscar quietly, and then you see a couple more of them slowly marching down the road towards them as they steal a car. It just felt like, oh God, the the Zygons have taken a couple steps backwards in their ability to blend in with humans again all of a sudden. That's did they actually, odd. did they do anything with that or did that just it was literally them stealing a car these people just quietly looking at them they get out of the car and start to slowly walk down the road towards them there's another pair down the other direction walking towards them they get a phone call from Bonnie and while that's happening uh, Osgood uses the sonic glasses to open up the car start it up and they leave to go and that's the things. end of it yeah so really, there was if there was any point if there was any scene that was a waste of time in this episode, it was that. That, that would have been the one to cut, yeah. Because there's it, it goes nowhere. It goes nowhere, and it also takes Zygons a couple steps back in the seriousness department. So if there's anything that should have been left on the cutting room floor, it would have been that particular sequence. All right, Bill, your least favorite scene. I'm going to go with the scene where they open up the box and it says truth or consequences. <laughs> Not because there's two boxes or even because that's the theme, but because the words on there make no sense when you look at the overall story. Even even if you take into account what they mentioned uh, at the very end, the final spoiler that had, it had happened in the past. You're saying he knew that this movement was going to have either, either that this movement was going to have that particular motto or that he forgot the fact that it's, I mean, I could see there's a truth box and a consequences box. That's, at least that's, that's how it felt to me. But there's not a truth and a consequences button in each one, or at least the way, the way he describes it. Obviously, they're both empty, but the way he describes them is as a truth box and a consequences box. So why would they both have buttons on that saying both, unless he specifically made these boxes after this movement started, which would be odd because there was already the box. So, to to, mm. to to use the quote that Matt likes to post a clip of, it just raises too many questions. <laughs> uh, well, it's a good clip. To a part, to a partially uh, understand part of it, is that you know it's the Zygons wanted the blue box. Because the blue box was reveal all or hide all forever. Um, and the red box was the unit box, which was nuke us, nuke them. Right. Kill one all box the truth and and one nuke box everybody. consequences. So why do the they one problem have I have with the label truth or consequences is it kind of made clear which button was which. Yeah. Because 
with the blue box, truth. Well, that's that's. Like, uh, you'd imagine that Bonnie would immediately pick it up, smack the truth button, mm-hmm. and nothing would happen, and the episode would have ended. Yep. So for me, it seemed to be a little. Um, once again, it was an overuse of truth or consequences, and was kind of made it a little too blunt. To be honest, all of them should have been labeled consequences. Personally, I would have liked it if they opened each box and there was a red button and a blue button. No label yeah. on them, just a red button and a blue button. Yeah. And somebody says, one button's truth, one button's consequences, but which is which? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or they go, well, what are these? What are their two buttons? And then the doctor turns around and with a straight face, truth or consequences. Yes. But yeah. Which is which. Been, I, 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 although, the thing is, I we're see already him doing this better than which, what's been written. How do we feel about the doctor's accent in that scene? I don't know if he was going for a specific character or just. Hmm? When I the doctor did that American someone accent like a game show host. I don't know if he was. I loved that. A specific game show host or what? It's, I actually freaking loved that accent. Do you, do you recognize the voice he was doing, or was it generic? Um, it was semi-generic. Um, it was kind of every game show announcer. It was a bit Don Pardo. It was a bit uh, the guy that used to do the announcement on The Price is Right. It was kind of an amalgamation of every famous game show announcer that has been around since the 70s. Not host, announcer. So, yeah. you know, the... the, the, gotcha. the, the the faceless voice. That's who Don Pardo was on the original Jeopardy. And I forget what the name of the guy was on, on uh, The Price is Right. It started with an R. Roddy something, I think. Roddy Piper? No. <laughs> that would make an interesting Price is Right host, or Price is Right announcer, though. <laughs> it would only last an episode before standards and practices got rid of it, but... Because as soon as someone mocks the voiceless, the the bodiless voice, he'll come down and slam them into the wall. Uh, but yeah, it was just that generic uh, announcer voice, but he did it beautifully. I was surprised at how well he did it. He's been around. Mm-hmm. I heard mm-hmm. that voice and I just started smirking. Mm. So, so wow, we powered Rod that Roddy, that was the guy that did uh, huh. um, the uh, announcers uh, for a good chunk of the prices, right? I actually had to look it up. All right. Um, so, where were we? Uh, I got we, were, we were closing up. Uh, um, we had just done my least favorite scene, I think. Yeah. Okay. So, Tim? So, it's time for Tim? I believe uh, uh, my least favorite scene was the scene where that poor, innocent Zygon is forced to turn back into a Zygon in front of uh, the other... in front of everyone. Because I don't think that scene was handled very well. Because it seemed to, it was supposed to be like this very dramatic scene, but it seemed kind of silly. Like, uh, like, what, like, uh, I, I felt, wait, what am I watching? All right, so this guy runs up to a bunch of kids on a bench. He turns into a Zygon, and then he runs off like he's not wearing any pants. And the kids couldn't even be bothered to react. Exactly. You know, it was like... Now, if he would have changed to his icon and then the kids freaked out and ran, that'd be another story altogether. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Still, you know, it is kind. Of, it is partially fear, partially embarrassment for the Zygons. I suppose that yeah. depends. Are Londoners anything like New Yorkers? Kind of. I honestly, because, I honestly, because I honestly don't happened, know. If that happened in like. Times Square, they, I don't think they'd have reacted. I don't think they would have reacted on State Street either, Matt. What do you think? Yeah. Kinda, sorta. State Street, yeah. you'll see anything happen almost. 
State Street, they'll just go, go crazy, man, crazy. Want to go get a beer? <laughs> <laughs> that was crazy, man. Want to go get some Taco Bell? Oh, State Street is, uh, by the way, uh, one of the major business thoroughfares right off the UW campus. And goes so, right up to the Capitol. Yep, it's right between campus and the Capitol. So it's a huge student area, but literally um, somebody could walk the length of State Street butt naked and no one would notice. No one would give hardly more than a shrug. So, yeah, that kind of happening, oh. I think the students would just be like, wow, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so I, you know, I don't know what area that was and what they were trying to go for. It might have been the director thought that if they screamed and ran, it would have been um, too fakey. I don't know. That are too horrific for the kids. Either way. <laughs> I think it would have been funnier in hell if he did that, and one of the kids decided to go for a photo bomb. Grabbed him and took a selfie, and then and then he ran off. That would have been funnier, but that mm -hmm. wasn't what they were going for. Pretty much, it's it's a really odd scene. It is, and yeah, that could have been handled better. So my least favorite scene. Um, unfortunately, both of mine were taken. Um, Thinking. Thinking if there's any other scene in there that uh, that annoyed me. I don't think so. I think I, I have to pass. Where were your other two? Uh, the one you mentioned and the one Bill mentioned. Okay. Because, yeah, the truth or consequences button still annoy the hell out of me. Let's add more truth and consequences because we haven't hammered this over your head yet. Yeah, that's what it really feels is that's it's it's the blunt hammer. So let's go ahead and bring it up to final thoughts here. Matt, ready? Final thoughts. Very well paced, well run, particular two parter. Um, no time wasted. Uh, decent characters. There are a few missed opportunities here and there. But they, uh, thankfully, are the rarity and not the rule. Oh, can I interrupt? Oh. I, I, I do have a, uh, uh, a least favorite scene. Okay. okay. The beginning. Oh, right. The, the grand freaking retcon that was the opening. That's right. Yeah, that opening retcon was bullshit. Yep. Where you started out, where you watched at the end of the last episode where she fired the rocket launcher and you heard the explosion to the opening of this episode where she raises the rocket launcher, goes to fire, hesitates, fires, misses, and then shoots and fires again to hit. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And there. And I, I'm going to say, I think I had mentioned it to uh, the, co the other hosts before the recording started. I'm just going to mention it here. What I think was the intended justification for this, although I can understand why it would be annoying, is that uh, what Doctor Who's been doing a lot of uh, for the past few years is basically they'll do a shortcut of the scene, such as the scene where uh, Clara sees, you know, Clara sees this, the boy screaming, and then they cut away, and then later on they're like, oh, and by the way, there was a whole scene that we kind of cut in between uh, frames there, and that's basically what's happening here is that we see her fire. There's an entire scene we don't see, and then it blows up. Except but there I was... do agree that in this kind of context, it's kind of annoying, because when a new episode starts, you kind of expect it to start after the cliffhanger, and ra not rather than sticking a whole bunch of scenes in between. Well, it's At least not than... ones that completely change what the cliffhanger means. It's even worse than that, Bill, because I don't think that that scene at the end actually cut away where you would have those added moments. You see her say, oh, Clara's dead. There, there, the, the cuts happened when you went from uh, third-person point of view to Bonnie point of view to third-person point of view is basically where the cuts happened. So it would, it would have happened in between going from Bonnie's eye looking through the viewfinder 
back to the third person view looking at Bonnie is what basically that's, would have where, been. Where, where that they scene happened cut. in between those cuts. That's bullshit. That yeah. is absolute Here, bullshit. Here's how the previous episode should have ended. It should have ended literally seeing her fire the rocket and it's heading towards the airplane. Yeah, yeah that, had, that, that, had, that I think would have been No different. explosion or anything, it's just heading that way. And then we could add the little tiny bit of extra with her... Uh, Osgood, uh, not, not Osgood, uh, yeah. with Clara, um, fighting with the, uh, Zygon for control and causing it to miss the first shot. I have right. to agree with Matt. If they didn't I, have I, the explosion I'll, I'll, in there. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Matt there as well. I would, I, I would, would even say cut it sooner. I would have said cut it, the, zoom in on her finger at the end, cut it with her finger mm. pulling the trigger. I, I would say that except I think that the... The audio, or you know, the 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 yeah, the 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 audio of either the trigger being pulled or the rocket firing, kind mm-hmm. of makes for a more dramatic ending than a zoom in on a finger about to pull. No, yeah. no, I'm I'm oh. I'm not saying that. I'm saying have her pull the trigger, mm-hmm. and there, but actually having her note the triggers pulled, and then you you do the 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 credit out sound. So you know the rocket's fired. You see the trigger pull. You hear the rocket fire. And just as you hear the rocket fire, it does the big ending score. Yes. That's where I would have ended it. I definitely know explosion. So, oh, go ahead Mm -hmm. and restart your final thoughts, Matt. I'm sorry. It just suddenly hit me. It just suddenly hit you, yeah. I I know the feeling. Um, But as I was saying, um, other than the few minor exceptions of some bad sequences here or there... A vast majority of this is really well done. It could have used a little bit less of the the get-the-point-across obvious hit-over-the-head hammer at the end as well. But, again, for the vast majority of this, the productions are pretty good. Um, We have we got some more uh, sets on this than we have been seeing lately. Um, We got a lot of location shooting, which helps with that, of course. Um... The Zygon suits, uh, we got this, I did not I did finally notice some differences differences between the multiple Zygons, so that was nice to see. And, uh, overall production values seem to be pretty high up there, uh, throughout the entire multiplayer, so that's pretty good. They did a pretty solid job altogether. Alright. Bill? I'm gonna say solid two-parter, uh... At first, I felt the best cliffhanger the show had had in quite a few years, although the the way the cliffhanger resolved kind of hurt the initial cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. Uh, Still a solid two-parter overall. As Matt's mentioned a few times, the pacing was pretty much brilliant. I don't think I could say anything negative about the pacing, really. Characters, uh, pretty much great. Uh, Homages to Harry Sullivan and also uh, the Brigadier and uh, his catchphrase. By the way, so totally retroactively called that. Yes, <laughs> yes, because yes, I, we, we, you were talking. You you weren't mentioning in reference to the episode, but you were talking about five rounds rapid last week, and yes. then she specifically said that in this episode. I'm like, oh fucking yes, <laughs> five rounds rapid, bitch. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> like, how, how did you escape? Five rounds rapid. <laughs> Cut the scene. <laughs> bam, 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 bam. Uh, def- definitely just a great, a great two-parter. Not, uh, not the top of the top, blow me away, but close to it. Mm-hmm. All right, Tim. Uh, the the second part of this two-parter was a lot better than the first part, so it brings it up in my mind. Uh. Peter Capaldi's uh, portrayal of the Doctor is just in continuing to climb, in my estimation. Uh... Just a minor thing. I, there were there were moments in this episode where he was Tom Baker, Christopher Eccleston, and the a tiny bit of David Tennant, yes. and some Matt Smith, mm-hmm. I think. Just Possibly a little bit. Uh, I uh, thought that... The uh, the character arc of Bonnie from uh, from bad person to good person was extremely well done, considering uh, that the time limit they had. Mm-hmm. And, and 
So that uh, gives, uh, I give props for that. As well as the uh, sort of uh, whole, uh, there will always be two Osgoods, no more, no less vibe I got. <laughs> you say that? <laughs> And and my brain, always even though I'm heart, a master always, and an apprentice, that's exactly what went through my mind. And I'm not the Star Wars guy. <laughs> to ask good mm. there are no more, no less. Still, mm. I, I do kind of like the idea of there being a secret army of Osgoods that even the Doctor doesn't know the number of. <laughs> Mm. It's what one of the revolutions goes by and reprograms all the all the all the all the Zygons to be Osgoods. Oh God! Now she's Agent Smith. Killed Osgood number 52, you did. God. Wait, what, 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 where, are we, where, where are we going? Put on the last suit you'll ever wear. The Osgood <laughs> suit. <laughs> See, now I, got, now I want, to, want, to, want to write an episode and send it to Moffat, the Osgood Revolution. <laughs> mm. But, uh, so that meant I think for me, uh, uh, this was a very uh, a good uh, two-parter, one of the better ones that I think uh, was meant to be a two-parter. So it was just the right length. All right. So in my opinion, this is probably one of the best two-parters we have seen in a long time. Um, it's right up there, and I mean, we've had some decent two-parters this year, especially, you know, like The Witch the Magician's Apprentice, The Witch's Familiar, was particularly well-liked by the majority of us, um, mm -hmm. and this is right up there, and it's, you know, been a long time since I've had a season where I can look at almost all the episodes and go, wow, these are good episodes, um... If it makes you feel better, the Mark Gaddis episode still hasn't come. I know! Dun, dun, dun. I know! I might be writing my own epitaph here, but... I, 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 I... There's nothing fundamentally wrong with this episode except it being a little heavy-handed with catchphrases. It's well-paced, it's well-directed, it's well-acted, it's well-written. And some people might have even liked Dr. Disco. <laughs> catchphrase. I want. I so wanted to call for him to call himself Doctor Feelgood. <laughs> He's the one they call Doctor Feelgood. He's the one that makes feel alright. <laughs> or Doctor Strange Love. Well, with the Doctor Feelgood, wouldn't by the end of the episode he'd be back in the TARDIS on the guitar playing that song? Probably. <laughs> Okay, so there's really f nothing wrong with this episode. I don't think it hits the high bar of episodes like Day of the Doctor, but it comes close. It comes very close if it just had a few tweaks. And mm -hmm. most of those tweaks could have been done with a couple minutes of thoughtful editing. So, all right, let's give it up for final ratings. Aaron is not here and thus unable to make a rating. She will add hers later to the stockpile. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Matt, what is your final rating for this uh, episode? Like I said, it all it takes is like maybe a couple edits and maybe one prop change. And this would be perfect. Five out of five. However, with that said, there are some noticeable flaws here and there. And and we can't fix that prop now. But uh, that doesn't tarnish it too badly, I think. Little tweaks is one thing. Having an explosively bad thing happen is another. So, 4.5. 4.5. Mm -hmm. Not enough to get the round up, huh? Nope. All right. So, Bill, you're next. I'm going to say like a 4.74, which means on our scale it's a 4.5. Like I said to Matt, not quite good enough for the round up. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the, the, the 4.5 to 5 round up is much steeper than the other round ups, so... All right, Tim. I'm going to go with the trend and give it a 4.5 because I saved my fives for the ones that I really just have to gush about. And this was a very well-made episode, but I'm not gushing about it. 
Yeah. All right. So the panel that's here kind of confirms it is a 4.5 straight through because I will give it that too. Like I said, it Ooh. is close to perfection. It's close to the, one of the Just best shy. episodes we've seen. Just a little bit shy. But just barely. So with a 4.5, <coughs> this will come in at number 15, uh, number 13 in our rankings. Darn straight. It is just below The Magician's Apprentice, The Witch is Familiar, because somebody gave that a 5. <laughs> and just or it's just below that and just above spare parts and the invasion. Ooh. So there you that go. That also makes this the second one. highest rated story this season, right behind the opening two parter. Which I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Capaldi is finally making some marks again in the high end. Yeah, well, this is a really good season. You know, if Moffat had been writing like this and editing like this from the opening gate in Series 5, I would be, you know, I would be saying wonderful things about him mm. all the time instead of, you know... Wanting to trying, crush his nads. Trying to, trying to, you know, arrange a hit on him. All right, and uh, since we're getting close to the time, it uh, looks like it's time for our uh, ending here. If you enjoy uh, listening to us or, uh, you know, want to be involved in our conversations, please uh, like this video and uh, subscribe on twitch.tv, uh, youtube.com, and mixcloud.com. You can also uh, like and subscribe for updates on Facebook and Twitter, and you can always support us on patreon.com slash unearthlypodcast. And uh, fans, don't forget to join us next week, same time, same channel, for Sleep No More by Mark Gaddis. Uh, Here we go. Strap on your Gaddis shite. goggles. We're about to go in deep. Here's. Mark Gaddis and found footage style. Oh, God. Geronimo! Losing my lunch already. Will to live, going away.